All right, I wanted to invite you to open the Word of God with me tonight, and we'll turn to uh, Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2 is where we're going to start off this evening. Revelation chapter number 2. Well, it's a blessing to be able to be with you again in the Lord's house and open the Word of God this evening. The opportunity that we have before us is going to be an interesting challenge as we look at the Word of God and as we see some of the things that God has uh, that He uh, helps us to see and understand. And so as we look at these things, I hope that it's a blessing and a help. Um, the Bible tells us that uh, when Satan met with God, uh, he was asked of the Lord where he had been, and he says, I've been roaming to and fro through the earth, and uh, we know uh, he's been... Uh, roaming to and fro on the earth and uh, seeking whom he may devour, as we saw already this morning. But uh, as we look at the scriptures, have you ever wondered, uh, you know, he might walk to and fro on the earth, but where does where does Satan live? You know, where's Satan's home? Does he have a place that he uh, likes to kick up his feet and make himself comfortable? And we're going to see a little bit of a hint of that here in Revelation chapter number two, and uh, we'll find out that uh, Satan does like to camp in certain locations. All right, Revelation two. You can look with me at verse number twelve and thirteen. As we get started, it says to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. All right, let's uh, ask God's guidance before we continue. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Fathers, we open your word this evening. We pray that the truth of the word would help us and encourage us and challenge us and that as we look at the themes you've given to us in this study that our lives will be helped and enabled to walk more closely with you please teach us and guide us and use and may your spirit uh, use this time to instruct our lives in a great way help us we pray in jesus name amen, amen. all right so here we have a, a interesting portion of scripture that the uh, the lord is speaking to this church in pergamos now uh, we don't uh, talk about pergamos a whole lot in the bible except for here but as we look at this, there's a couple things that are mentioned there in verse number 13 that really give us an interesting point to pause. And that is, he says, I know that works and where that dwells, even where Satan's seat is. And then in the end of the verse, it talks about Antipas, who was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And so we find some interesting things here. We find that Satan does have places that he likes to visit and even to, to dwell there or to uh, have a place of resting, a seat, where he can uh, take some time to, uh, to abide in the same place. Uh, seats aren't anything you ever uh, uh, stand, you know, stand in briefly or that you uh, run through seats. You know, a seat is a place where you dwell for a period of time. You abide there. It might not be a very long period of time, but it is a place of pausing. And so we do find that the Bible talks here about uh, Satan having places that he likes to inhabit and that he likes to stick around in those sort of places. And the interesting thing is, too, that uh, it really seems like it wasn't too far away from where God's people were. <laughs> because let's read verse 13 again. He says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now, there's a real strong connection between where these saints lived and where Satan lived. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to understand that oftentimes where God's people abide is one of the places where Satan likes to camp out, where he likes to, uh, you know, set up shop and do a, a work to try and hinder God's work and God's people. Yeah. And so sometimes that is the case. But we would also want to make our place of abode and our lives uh, spiritually, the place where we spiritually abide, a place where Satan is uh, is rather more uncomfortable than comfortable. Uh, we would like that if Satan did make a habitation and camp out near us, that it would be a war camp, not a yeah. camp where he can get comfortable. Right. And uh, certainly as we labor for the Lord, we do have to have those times of battle with spiritual darkness and wickedness in this world. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual wickedness in high places. So uh, we have a great adversary. Now, uh, we do know also from 2 Corinthians 11, 14, the Bible says that no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, this teaches us that uh, Satan is very good at deception and um, right. disguise and confusion. He really likes to sneak in where he's least expected. Okay. Wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Uh, I heard a preacher recently talking about uh, 
when he was younger watching the, the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show, uh, hopefully uh, some of this will get uh, some of us uh, connected here. Uh, and he used to watch, have you, have you ever watched the Roadrunner segments yeah. of that? They were always amusing. Um, and uh, he said he used to watch this, and he, he watched Wile E. Coyote, and he'd, he'd uh, buy these gadgets and gizmos uh, to try and use them to catch the Roadrunner. And one of the things he did one time was he, he bought uh, some wool and put, on a, put the wool on so he'd look like a sheep. And, uh, and this preacher said, he said, when I watched that, I always thought, there's no way that's going to work. There's too much wolf showing. <laughs> there's too much coyote showing in there. And because uh, the wool didn't quite cover. And so Satan, he loves to wear that disguise. But you know what? He does leave a little hanging out sometimes because right. he's not a he's not a, a perfect imitation of truth. Okay. And so as we look at things uh, in life, it's helpful for us to understand that even some of the things that sometimes we might think are justified and right are sometimes the very places where the devil loves to camp out and do some of his most devious work. So I want you to look at three areas of life wherein Satan, the scripture teaches us, can find a habitation place even in the lives of, of uh, Christian people who ought to be standing for the Lord and doing what is right. And so uh, we ought to uh, look into these things this evening with an awareness that uh, our preconceptions of ourselves or of the situations uh, need to be uh, validated through scripture that we need to evaluate what God has to say for us. Uh, so we need to be careful not to persuade ourselves that things are right when we need to be very careful to see what God has to say. So we're going to look briefly at three things this evening that uh, the Bible talks about as places where the devil can take a foothold in our lives. The first one is going to be found for us. Uh, oh, by the way, the title is Where Satan Lives. The uh, first one is going to be found in Ephesians chapter 4. So you can turn with me there to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll look at a couple of verses there that help us understand that uh, the choices and the behaviors of our life can really give Satan a foothold and a place to camp out in our lives. All right, Ephesians 4, we'll look at verse 26 and verse number 27. It says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And uh, in my Bible, I've circled that the punctuation at the end of verse 26 to remind myself that these two are connected in the same sentence. And sometimes we can read verses and, and miss the context, and sometimes we'll miss out on great truths that are helpful for us. And so oftentimes it's good to notice that things are connected in the scripture, and that helps us to understand. Context is one of the most important rules for understanding the Bible, of course. Context is tremendously helpful. Uh, so the thing that he teaches us here is that one of the areas of our life where we can make wrong choices and have wrong behavior that really opens up territory for the devil to find a place to, to dwell and abide is a place of anger. When we're living in a place of anger in our walk with the Lord and with each other, uh, we can really open the door to our adversary. And I do, and, and I do say uh, in our relationship with God and our relationship with each other, because sometimes people say, think about anger in relationship with each other, but forget that sometimes sometimes people get angry at God too. Yeah. You know, sometimes people can get frustrated at God for what's been allowed in their life. They can think God's unfair and get angry at God for the situations, and uh, and even Christians at times can can get into a situation where they get so focused on their problems and their hurts and their sufferings and sometimes people get mad at God for allowing what he has allowed in their life and and so we need to be very careful not to uh, open a door of, of invitation to our adversary uh, in this area of anger. Anger is a very powerful, powerful force and it's easy for us to understand uh, the, the backsides of anger, the dangers of anger, the downsides uh, in that uh, we can see that in some levels. But we do understand also that God gets angry. <laughs> and we do see the anger of the Lord often in Scripture. The Bible talks often about the wrath of God, about the anger of God. We see Jesus in the temple when he, he saw the evil that was being done in that holy place. Boy, he got mad. Right. He was very angry. He made a scourge of small cords, chased all the animals out. He overthrew the uh, the, the money changers' tables yeah. and changed, right. chased some of these people out as well. And, and so he was very angry. So we... We understand that there is some value to anger when it's in the right way and the right timing. Yeah. And so this scripture does give us the encouragement, be angry and sin not. Right. Uh, if you're going to be angry, make sure it's done in a way that's not sinful. Neither let the sun, or let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And so we find that inappropriate anger uh, really uh, can open the door to our spiritual adversary. You know, Satan loves it when God's people are angry the wrong way. That's right. 
He loves it. He'll camp out on that all day long, all night long. He'll stay in that kind of a place for a long time. Anger can be a key that opens the door that lets the devil into our lives. If you want the devil to camp out in your house, uh, stay angry. Get angry the wrong ways. Uh, deal with anger in the wrong ways. Anger can be very powerful. Now, anger is meant to be powerful, right? God's anger is powerful. It's, it's powerful to uh, bring about needed force for change in the situations in which it's needed. God's anger is very powerful and very useful and important part of his character. And it's, when it's just, it's really a good thing when it's used properly. But the problem is that the power that we so often use anger for is all misguided. Mm -hmm. I wish that I could say I believed that most of our anger is justified, but I feel like it's probably more likely the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, based on my experiences of life and my experiences of being around uh, many people in times of their anger, Hi. anger more often than not I think is probably not justified than justified. But I wanted to remind you of a few things that we've looked at in the past that are key indicators for us as to whether or not our anger is going to open the door to the devil or whether it's, it's a righteous anger that we see here in verse 26. Be angry and sin not. You can be angry without sinning. Right. Okay, so we'll rush through these fairly quickly. I did preach a whole sermon that dealt with some of these uh, um, uh, several years ago. You can, you can look it up on our podcast. The title of this sermon was uh, Anger Danger. Yeah, anger danger. Um, and so you can look that up if you want to get, get all the verse references and some of the explanations for what I'm going to mention. But, but just briefly, I did want to touch on some key indicators of whether or not our anger is, is biblically justified. Because we always feel like it's justified, don't we? Like, we? We wouldn't be angry if we didn't feel like we had a good reason. Okay, so we're going to cover these really quickly. So here's some signs that my anger might be wrong. Number one, if it's without a cause. Matthew 5 says if you're angry without a cause. And as I said, we always have a reason that we feel is justified, but a reason is not the same thing as a cause. Uh, David was a good example of that. He said uh, when they were saying, oh, you just want to be here because you just want to see the fight. And he says, no, is there not a cause? Uh, there's something greater than my desires here uh, that, that is why I'm here and doing what I'm doing and saying what I'm saying. Um, if our anger has no greater cause than our own feelings and our own hurts, uh, that's not what the Bible's talking about with just anger. Uh, we, can get, we can very often get angry about what people have done to us and what people have done to hurt us. Look, if you're angry because, because right was violated, because God was offended, uh, because other people were hurt, that's more likely a safe territory. But if you're just angry because somebody inconvenienced you or somebody made you feel bad, somebody stepped on your toes, somebody got in your way, that's probably wrong anger. Uh, anger is also wrong if it hinders your worship. Yeah. Matthew 5 talks about that a little bit as well. Um, if your anger is keeping you from your walk with the Lord, if your anger is keeping you right. from, from prayer, from Bible reading, yeah. from church, if your anger is keeping you from doing the will of God and seeking the Lord from the heart, mm -hmm. that's probably a bad sign. Yeah. If your anger is quick to arrive, yeah. James chapter 1, uh, let her man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Amen. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Right. And so when we are quick to get angry, just blowing up like dynamite with a quarter of an inch fuse, um, that's a very bad sign, okay? Uh, you can do a lot of damage in a hurry, and oftentimes quick anger is so damaging because it ends up realizing, boy, if I'd taken five minutes to think this over, I would have realized maybe I didn't have a reason to get angry, and maybe things weren't the way they looked. And so quick anger is probably very, very damaging and probably wrong. Uh, another indicator that your anger might not be right is if it's slow to depart, and that's what we see here in this context. He says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, I don't know if, if God means this literally, that uh, you know, right now the sun is setting at about, uh, I don't know, 6.50 in the evening uh, in this location. If that means 6.50 in the evening is your cutoff, and you can, you can stay mad up till there, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think that God, what God is emphasizing is, don't stay mad. Yeah. Don't, don't let it linger. And certainly, uh, whether you take the... the sundown line literally. I really think that if you're angry about something that happened to you yesterday, uh, then that's certainly not right. Yeah. Any farther back than that is certainly a, a violation of this command. All right, so if it's without cause, if it hints my worship, if it's uh, slow to arrive, or, or quick to arrive, or slow to depart, if it leads me to, to do sin. And that's why I think he's saying here, be angry and sin not. 
You know, you can be angry, but don't mix it with sin. Yeah. Uh, don't let your anger cause you to do things or say things that are wrong and unkind. And we certainly see that in these verses uh, where it, it, right after he talks about anger here in Ephesians 4, uh, Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Uh, there's a lot that comes with anger sometimes, sins that accompany it. Uh, when the anger is wrong, it's probably going to be accompanied by a lot of other things as well. Right. Harsh words, unkindness, coarse language, uh, maybe physical aggression or violence. Uh, maybe uh, malice and an intent to hurt and harm people. Uh, anger can really go wrong in a hurry, and uh, it rarely is, when the anger is wrong, it's rarely the only wrong that's happening. Right. Uh, the next thing that is an indicator that our, our anger is wrong is when our anger causes us to copy what we're angry at. Mm, yeah. that, that's a good sign you're on the wrong track. Yeah. Why are you angry? Because that person was angry at me, so I'm angry at them. Well, they hit me, so I hit them back. Well, if you're just doing the same thing, this is not a good sign. If it's just for you to be angry at what they're doing, then it's certainly not just for you to participate and do the exact same thing. But we are made by God to be very uh, highly influenced by what goes on in our life. Right. And uh, God designed us that way because he wants us to fellowship with him and be very susceptible to his positive influence. But the devil likes to hijack that and make us highly susceptible to the bad influences of, of things that are going on in our lives, where those who are doing wrong, often we in our, our anger against that will respond by ending up doing the same thing. Uh, people who get mad at people who are critical are very often criticize them. <laughs> you know, if you, uh, somebody gets mad and then the other person gets mad at them for getting mad. Well, this is the same problem. And so we need to be very careful that we don't allow anger to lead us down the road of imitating evil. But also, part of the reason why anger is so serious is because it, it opens a door for us, when the anger is wrong, to be controlled by the devil. Mm -hmm. um, some of the phrases we use to describe people's anger are indicative of the fact that when we get angry in a wrong way, we can really get out of control. Yeah. You know, you can say somebody blew a fuse or they... Uh, they you, my mind's gone blank, but you can think probably of, of different metaphors we use for people who are angry. They're like a loose cannon, you know, yeah. you know anything can happen. Right. And uh, like a raging bull. When we are out of control, then something else or someone else can control us. And so anger opens the door to the devil because what we do then is when our, our spirit is not in the control of the Lord, the devil loves to come in and take the steering wheel and start driving us all over the place. And so anger is one of the areas that Satan loves to camp out in God's people's lives. And so we need to be very careful to guard against that. Not let anger fill our hearts to bring us to a place where Satan is much more comfortable in our life than he should be. Uh, every time Satan shows up in your life and mine, I hope that he is just irritated to death and wants to get out of there. Amen. That's the way we should want to live our lives, to where our lives are such an irritation to the devil that he wants to either destroy us or just get out of there. Yeah. But he doesn't feel comfortable in the spirit of our right. lives. Amen. The spirit of our lives should be filled with the Lord's spirit and guided by him. Right. And so anger is that first area whereby the devil can make himself at home in your life and mine uh, if we will open, uh, if we'll turn the key of anger, where we will open the door to our adversary and he'll love to camp out there and make his habitation there. Now, the next one is found in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Uh, this is one of the characteristics for uh, the office of a pastor or uh, the Bible word is bishop or a pastor. Also the Bible uses the word elder to describe the same office. And so 1 Timothy 3 gives the qualifications for a pastor. And in verse number 6, it says he should be not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so one of the important characteristics for a pastor to be is somebody who's not just a brand new Christian. We don't want to just take somebody who's been saved a very short period of time, maybe they don't have a lot of experience in the scripture, they don't have the spiritual maturity to handle it, and then all of a sudden they're given this position as an under-shepherd for the Lord. And so pride needs to be very uh, carefully guarded against because this is one of the areas that the devil really does great work. I'll give you another example of that. 
So we've seen our first one was anger. The second one is pride. Uh, and here's another verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, the Apostle Paul says, unless I should be exalted above measure, it sounds like pride, doesn't it? Yeah. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Do you see here again a connection between the work of the devil and, right. and pride sneaking into that situation? And so uh, Satan was at work in his life at the same time he was trying to, uh, and he and God were working to eliminate the area of pride in his life. And so we need to be very careful because pride can be a uh, snare and condemnation of the devil. Uh, he loves to work in that area of pride, which is interesting because that's what got him started. Yeah. You can look very easily back to Isaiah chapter 14 and you can find the story of Lucifer, that, that cherub of God who had, had been in the presence of the Lord, one of those covering cherubs who had been in the presence of the Lord. Uh, you, you may remember in... Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6 it talks about those cherubim that they 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 were in the presence of the Lord uh, They were there uh, Satan was in that place in the original uh, time uh, before the fall of man and And he had had that privilege he had, had the opportunity. He was he was as far as we can tell the highest uh, Office among the angels. He was the leader. He was the big kahuna. You know, he was the boss of all the angels uh, He was next under God basically in all creation um, Before creation of man and so he was he was it. I mean that was the top There was nobody on top of him, but God and he got so lifted up in pride that he said, you know what, I am pretty awesome. I actually think I can do God's job. I'm gonna take God's place. I'm gonna rule. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And and when you read Isaiah 14, the passage that talks about that, you see five times he says, I will, I will, I will. And the emphasis of Satan was I, I, I. And so that's why I've often called pride the, the five-eyed monster, because uh, we get so focused on I, on myself, when we get into pride. We start to think that we are the one who can do it, we are the one that can handle it, we are the one who ought to be respected and, and appreciated. And this is, this is why, I, remember I said at the beginning that Satan comes as an angel of light, and he likes to persuade us that wrong things are right. Uh, the first one, he does that with anger, right? He likes to tell us we've got a reason to be angry, we've got justification, you know, people are doing wrong, the situation's not fair, whatever's going on, he tries to tell us we've got justification for anger. But the second one, it's true as well, that Satan likes to tell us uh, that we are something special, that we are better than other people, that we are important. Does this feel like deja vu from this morning? I know we talked about pride this morning and humility a little bit. Uh, and and this wasn't coordinated this way. This was just how the Lord directed the studies for today. But but Satan loves to feed us that lie. Why? Because he knows it works. Why does he know it works? Because it worked on him. Amen. I mean, that was the key start to his rejection by God, him being cast out of heaven. Uh, Bible scholars believe that he took up to a third of the angels of heaven with him in his rebellion against God. They were cast out of heaven and reserved in chains of darkness until the day of judgment. Uh, there's there's uh, angels uh, facing judgment and, and certainly Satan as their leader uh, does still have influence in this world. And so we need to be on guard against one of his key weapons, and that is this area of pride. Mm -hmm. Because we fall into that condemnation and that snare of the devil that is pride. Uh, this just shows us how incredibly wicked he is. Right. Because here is something that destroyed him, and he wants others to suffer just like he's suffering. Mm -hmm. He wants other people to be just as miserable as he is. And, and that's a cruel and wicked place to be where you want other people to suffer and hurt, mm -hmm. where you want other people to be in a bad place in a bad state. Uh, as we look at the Christian life, we need to understand how vicious and unrelenting our adversary is and how deceptive he is to try and sneak us into the area of pride. Uh, our society today pumps the promotion of self-respect, self-esteem, self-worth. All of these things are synonymous with pride. I don't know if you've ever done this, but one time, just just to just to verify for myself, because I you know I preach about pride occasionally, and sometimes I have to deal with these things. I went to my dictionary. I looked up the word pride. Do you know what the definition for pride was in the dictionary? It was self-esteem, self-respect. Right. So anytime people talk to you about you need more self-esteem, you need more self-respect, what they're saying is you need more pride. Yeah. 
And you will find that all over our society today. And this is one of the lies of the devil. And I hope that it doesn't creep into your heart and mind where we start to feel like, yes, I should respect myself. Yes, I am important. Yes, I do have uh, uh, the right to do and feel and say what I am. And we need to be very careful not to allow Satan to, to get us in the area of pride because that's one of the places he loves to camp out in our lives. If he can find somebody who's lifted up in pride where their where they're value for themselves, their perspective of themselves is lifted up, as we talked about this morning, beyond the measure that's appropriate, um, we should find our value in Christ, not in ourselves. When he finds that, boy, he's going to camp there all day long. He's going to love that location. And he's going to set up shop. That's going to be a place where Satan's seat is going to be, a place of pride. We need to be very careful that we don't get so wrapped up in ourselves because we'll make a very small package. I think it's especially dangerous in, in the, the period of history that we live in because we live in a society that is so involved, for the most part, yeah. in social media. Yeah. Because social media is really dangerous when it comes to this area of self-focus. Yeah. Pride, narcissism, paying attention to yourself, uh, wanting to promote yourself. And we need to be very careful that we don't fall into that trap because these things are designed around that sort of activity and behavior. And it needs to be uh, needs to be guarded against so we don't start um, seeking attention that, to be drawn to ourselves, always getting everybody to look at us, pay attention to us, oh, me, 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 me. Uh, you know, at every conversation shouldn't just be about ourselves. It should be about how we can draw people to Christ, how we can make people, uh, uh, show people the love of Christ and show people the compassion of the, of the Lord and, and not just always be wrapped up in ourselves because that's what the devil loves. When we are all about self, Satan will have a heyday because self is again that key that will open the door to what the devil wants for our lives and as you and i get wrapped up in the wrong focus in life we are creating great opportunity for us to be drawn into something that's one of the greatest dangers of the christian life sometimes sometimes the greatest danger you can have in your christian life is is to succeed at the right things you say that doesn't sound right i know it doesn't sound right but like the apostle paul what do we see here in 2 Corinthians 12? He says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He says, I had been shown so much by God that there was a temptation danger that I might start to think I was special. Right. Wow. Yeah. God thinks I'm pretty, look how much God has shown to me, I must be. And he said, I, God was working in my life to try and keep me from that and to help me stay humble. And sometimes when we get to be successful at certain things in life, sometimes that can be one of the greatest dangers in life. Whether we're successful in ministry, whether we're successful in um, opportunities of business, whether we're successful in our family, in our community, success can be one of the danger zones where if we will, we will look at that with a wrong perspective, we might get lifted up in pride and fall into that snare of the devil. Like the Bible talked about there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about this, this novice getting put into a great position of prominence when he's not spiritually mature for it, yeah. he can really get lifted up in pride. Look at me, I'm, a, you know, I'm the king of the world over here. And really get lifted up in pride. And the next thing you know, he he thinks his pride is taking him up. Oh, but I'll let you know on a secret, it doesn't. Okay. Pride always takes you straight down. Amen. A lot Amen. faster than you would, thought you were right. going up. I'll give you a verse for that. Uh, and that's in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 23. It says, a man's pride shall bring him low, that's right. but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Amen. Uh, if you want to head straight up in your Christian life, uh, get humble in a hurry. That's, right. uh, that's the best way to do it. If you want to take a face plant, uh, probably the quickest way that I can think of is to start thinking you're special and get full of yourself. Because I'll let you, let you in on a secret. The more you walk with the no your nose in the air, the more like you, likely you are to trip over something. Amen. And we need to keep ourselves humble, <laughs> keep a right perspective of our walk with the Lord and of our value before God. Our value is because of what he has done, mm -hmm. not because of what we have done or who we are. And so pride is an important one for us to be on guard against because that, I believe, is one of the places where Satan loves to camp out. He loves to abide in that place. And we got time for one more. Now, obviously, this series could go, uh, like, I could turn this into a whole series. There's so many things we can say that these are keys of what the devil uh, loves and things where he can really get his, get a foothold. But I've tried to narrow it down to three that I think are key for us this evening that I, that I believe will be a help. Um, I was even tempted to stretch it to four um, because one was just 
it was it was too good to pass up. But I really think God wants us just to stay to free tonight. So the next one is going to be found for us in Matthew 17, and so this will be our third and last for the evening. Places where Satan loves to get a foothold. Matthew 17, and we'll look there at verses 14 to 21. This story is pretty familiar to us, uh, but it gives us a bit of a, a clue as to the hindrance that, that we can see in our Christian lives. All right, starting in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 17. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we might feel like in our Christian life, things are just getting bogged down, we're not seeing victory, we're not seeing progress, we're not seeing the miracles that we're praying for. And sometimes we might feel like, God, why is everything going wrong? Why, why isn't it working? I've tried all the right stuff. You might feel like these disciples. Here they were. I mean, they were trying to cast a demon out. It, it, it's hard to find something much better to do with your life than to fight the devil. I mean, and try and help somebody who is being afflicted. Uh, they were doing the right thing, but it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And why was it that, that that evil spirit could camp out in that situation? Right. And Jesus gives it very plainly. He says, because of your unbelief. That's right. It's yeah. plain and simple. He says, you just didn't believe that that i was going to do what i told you i could do right. unbelief and sometimes the devil likes to whitewash unbelief and he'll call it realism or rationalism yeah, and just yeah. common sense you know don't get carried away just be realistic pragmatic practical <laughs> but sometimes we need to just get get real violent with practicality and kick Amen. it out the door when god tells us to live by faith Amen. Now, i'm not saying we should be reckless with things that god hasn't yeah. clearly spoken on right. But when God has given us clear direction, we can just stand up and say, let's go. Amen. <laughs> I don't have to fear. I don't have to doubt. I can just live by faith and see what God can do because God has been clear with me on something. That's right. And so we need to be very careful because unbelief is tremendously dangerous. And, and the devil loves when God's people don't believe what God has told us. Right. Our faith in God is still the victory that overcomes the world. Hey. And so I wanted to give you three things under this last one of unbelief. The first thing I wanted to say about unbelief is unbelief defies God. That's why the Bible takes it so seriously. It's a sin. Unbelief is a sin. Uh, it's evil for us to who know the Bible and have the revelation of Scripture to say, no, I don't think that's going to work. When God said it's going to work. That's right. You know, for us to say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe. No, no. If God said it, just just believe it. You can, right. you can run on that. Right. Go for it. Maybe. Believe it and live it. You don't have to live in unbelief. Jesus had given these disciples the power to cast out devils. Mm -hmm. And here they are going, I hope this works. Hope? What's to hope? It's going to work. <laughs> Jesus said you have the power to do that. And when he gave that power to these disciples, they didn't need to hope. They didn't need to doubt. They didn't need to wonder. Mm -hmm. They just needed to believe that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. Amen. They could have cast that demon out yeah. if they'd had faith in God. Mm -hmm. It is almost blasphemy for us to deny his truth, you know, to, to, to suggest in our hearts and minds that God is not going to do what he said he's going to do, that he's not able or that he doesn't care or that he doesn't want to or that he's not going to fulfill those promises. Uh, that's wickedness. And we need to that's condemn right. it in our hearts as such and say, no, I'm not going to go down that road. That's wickedness to think such evil thoughts about my God. He has made a promise. He will fulfill it. The Bible says he cannot he cannot deny himself. That's right. God yeah. will always do right. Yeah. Always. And we need not fear and doubt. Right. So unbelief defies God. Unbelief defeats growth. Mm -hmm. You know, unbelief will keep us from the things that will grow us. Yeah. The things that will stretch our faith. The things that will help us to grow in our walk with God. The things that will teach us more about our Savior and about how to walk with Him. How to know Him. How to have that relationship with Him. Unbelief and doubt will cause us to be withheld from the things that will take us to the next level in our Christian life. 
And sometimes the reason people are not getting to the next level in their Christian life is because they don't believe they can get there. They don't believe that God will forgive them. They don't believe that God will use them. They don't believe that God will answer their prayers. They don't believe that the miracles they need are possible. And so they keep living in the same level they've always been at, maybe for years, maybe for decades, and living stuck in that level because they don't believe that anything else is possible. But I still believe that Jesus said he, he came that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. Amen. Well, more abundantly than what? Well, yeah. I think that's open to some interpretation, but I really believe it's more abundantly than we are now. Amen. Not just more abundantly than we were before we got saved. That's right. But I believe more abundantly than we are now, that our, our abundant life can continue growing. You say, I don't know if that's possible. Can you continue to grow? I don't know. God's infinite. So I think he can continue to Amen. grow us right from here until we stand before him in eternity. I really, right. You don't have to agree with me on that interpretation of that verse, but... But God wants us to live an abundant life. Yeah. I really believe Jesus, when he said to his disciples, he that believeth in me, the same works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Amen. Uh, God's call for us as Christians is greater works. Yeah. He wants to see mighty miracles accomplished in our lives through so the walk with the right. Lord. And so we need to cast out unbelief because it really defeats our growth. It'll stagnate our growth and yeah. keep us from moving on to another level in our Christian life where we're more effective for Christ, where we're more in tune with the Spirit of God, more used of the Savior, and able to make a greater impact. Amen. So unbelief defies God, it defeats growth, and unbelief will delay gains in our Christian life. Right. It'll slow us down. Um, how much progress are we making if we don't believe that we can make that progress? Uh, right. We want to see the church grow. We want to see our lives and our walk with the Lord continue to go forward. Yeah. But unbelief will often hinder that um, because how are we going to how are we going to make progress in our Christian lives? How are we going to win souls and see this this ministry grow in usefulness for the Lord right. without the faith to act and do what needs to be done? Because it's easy for us to sit at home and say, well, it won't work anyways. Why should I bother trying? Yeah. Well, no, unbelief is going to delay the growth right. that God wants to give us in life and in ministry. Amen. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. If, if I, you know, we've got our Soul Patrol Thursday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to go out and try and talk to people about Christ. If I go out on Thursday night not believing that anybody's going to be willing to hear the gospel, not believing that anybody's willing to get saved, should I be surprised if nobody does? Yeah, no. If I go out in unbelief, well, what should I expect? Nothing. That's right. <laughs> I mean, God might work in spite of me occasionally. Uh, yeah. But if I go out in faith, believing, yes, there are people who need the gospel in this town. Mm -hmm. And yes, God's word yes. will not return void. Amen. And yes, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. The Jew right. first, also the Greek. If I go out in faith, I am much more likely to see people yeah. respond to the gospel than if I go in unbelief. Well, you know, the world today is just going to hell in a handbasket. Nobody listens and nobody wants to hear. I, really, I got so many doors slammed in my face last time I went. You know, we can get in a real bad attitude about witnessing. And whether it's knocking on doors or whether it's witnessing somebody in your neighborhood or on the job site, if we go in unbelief, believing it's not going to work, it's not going to happen, how are we ever going to get ahead in our walk with the Lord and in our labors for the Lord? Right. Unbelief. The devil loves that because it defies God, because it will defeat growth, and because it will delay gains in our walk with the Lord and our service for the Lord. Mm -hmm. You can do all the right things without faith and faith. Right. That's right. That's what we see with these disciples. I mean, they were doing the right thing. They were in the right yep. place at the right time doing the right thing. Yep. Why did they fail? Mm -hmm. Just unbelief. Yeah. And I say just unbelief. Like it's a small thing. It's not a small thing. Right. That was the whole reason they failed that day. Right. And that's the big reason why sometimes you and I might fail in our Christian walk, in our ministry for the Lord. Why we might be less effective than God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. Unbelief. So we need to be very careful. Um, James chapter 1 and verse 6 talks about prayer. As we've seen already in verse 21 here, it talks about prayer. Um, James 1 and verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. That's the man who's in unbelief. Yeah. Just driven with the wind and tossed like a wave. Every which way, no matter what influence is going on around him, he's just thrown all over the place. Don't be a wave that's, right. that's just pushed around in unbelief. But stand firm upon the rock of faith uh, in Jesus Christ 
anchor your soul into him and say, I believe it. And you can stand through the storms and the turmoil. <laughs> you and I, as we labor the Lord, we can cast the devil out of our lives by faith. Amen. You know what? Unbelief, the devil loves it. But when we pull out faith in God, the devil gets uncomfortable in a hurry. Right. Satan's seat can be overthrown in your life and mine when we choose to live by faith, to believe that what God said is true, that what God has promised is going to come to pass, that God really does love us, that God really will forgive us, that God really will live, uh, live in us and through us, that God really will transform our lives and change us into something wonderful and powerful for his yeah. glory and for our good. We start living by faith. We start having victory over pride and over anger. These are some tremendous key battlegrounds where we can have victory over the devil, not just this week, but today. Tonight, before we leave this place, let us come to God by faith and say, God, I believe your word. I am going to trust you. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to labor in your strength. I'm going to believe. I'm not going to lift myself up and think I'm something special. I'm not going to get involved in wrong, wrong anger in situations of life. But I'm going to trust you and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put you first in all things and let you be the central focus of my life rather than self and rather than anger. Yeah. And as we do that. We are submitting ourselves to God. We are resisting the devil. And the Bible promises in James 4, 7, he will flee from us. Yeah. And so make the devil uncomfortable camping in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Don't let him get there and find a, a, a comfortable spot through either anger, pride, or unbelief. But rather, let him find a place of peace, of humility, and a place of faith. Yeah. Where he finds, I don't like this place. i got to get out of here. <laughs> Uh, let's ask God to help us with that as we close. Heavenly Father, we need your help in an urgent way in our lives day by day. Without you, we can do nothing. And I pray that as we seek after you in this hour, that each of us would leave this place tonight with a heart in the place that you want it to be in. Lord, may the devil not find a foothold in any of our lives tonight. May we, as we yield ourselves to you in humility and in faith, uh, find that you give us victory in the areas of life that you speak to us about. Help us, Father, we pray as we give our lives to you. And none of us will leave this place tonight without having done business with you from the heart. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.